Welcome to my round four analysis of uh, this year's World Chess Championships and uh, the Gladiators battle on. And in this case, we had Magnus with the white pieces trying to prove an advantage for maybe one of the first times in a match against Fabiano Caruana. Now, I predicted a win for Magnus here. I thought they both had shown some nerves and now they'd be settled down. But let's see what happened in this game. Hard to predict Magnus's first moves, and here he started with c4, the English opening in London, quite appropriate. One move I didn't actually think he would play uh, during his tournament. It's becoming, I think, quite clear that he doesn't want to play e4. I'd be surprised if he plays this on move one. Fabiano plays in very traditional way. Fabiano is a, is a traditionalist, really, at the chessboard. He, he loves control in the center and give him a chance to control the center, he will do. So he puts the pawn in the center of the move, uh, center of the board, move, move in the center of the board. Magnus develops, knight c3, knight f6, and we have the four knights variation of the English opening. White trying to control the light squares and black developing and trying to get some stake in the center of the board. And it's quite interesting this open. This was really first seen in world championships level um, I think it was Seville 88 between the well two of the biggest legends Kasparov and Karpov who, who fought for the world championships on on a couple of occasions and the most popular line then <coughs> was g3 bishop b4 but nowadays black plays d5 and this could not have been a surprise to Magnus because again like I said Fabiano loves taking space he loves taking the center yeah, you know, there's a couple of schools of thought in chess. One of them is the traditional way of playing, take the center of the board. And then there's the hyper modern way of playing where you try to control the center from the sides. You know, sometimes like in a way Magnus is doing here, putting the bishop to the side of the board. But no surprise Fabiano plays in this very traditional way. Magnus takes on d5, plays bishop g2. And here a move which has just recently become... Um, a bit more popular for black black used to play knight b6 here retreating from the center but avoiding tactics with that knight on d5 for example bishop e7 can often run into something like knight takes e5 and this little tactic works out uh, very well for white so we now had bishop to c5 and one thing i, I would like to just say about this this opening is that it's really a reverse sicilian so if you just divulge me for a minute, it started with c4, e5, but if we flip the boards and allow white to play e4 and move one, the most popular opening against that is c5, the, the Sicilian opening. And really what we see in the game is a reversed dragon opening. So we get this position here which is the dragon variation of the Sicilian. And again, th this was actually very popular, especially in the karpov Korchnoi World Championship match. The problem with playing this move, you're a tempo down on what Magnus does with the other color. And this gives white more chances to develop a very aggressive attack with queenside castling. So with this variation, let's go back and flip the, the pieces around. Hopefully you understood that little you know, change of colors, change of pieces, but it's the same patterns. If we look at this position, it takes a lot longer for black to develop the same attack with this. White has an extra tempo, which is extremely useful. So bishop c5 is this quite new move. White castled. There are ideas of taking on e5, but they seem to be absolutely okay for black. And now simply d3, 
allowing the bishop on c1 to move. Rook to e8, and this is the so-called reverse Karpov system. One of Black's main ideas is to place the bishop on g4, put the knight into d4, and then hope at some point that there will be a capture on d4 when Black can take with the e-pawn. And if you can imagine that position there, the rook on e8 suddenly becomes very useful attacking down that half open file. So this is Black's main idea, is to put a knight here, bishop here, pressurize mainly these two squares, f3 and e2. What's White's main idea? Well, White has a half open file on the queen side here. And when you have a half open file, it's a straight line. You put straight line pieces on it, a rook. So White often wants to put the rook on c1, get pressure on this line. And a very common maneuver that White does in the Sicilian and in this opening, this knight will often try to travel around and land on this square, um, especially when it's supported by a rook on c1. So these are the kind of maneuvers that both sides are considering in the middle game. And it's very important when you're playing chess, you know, reading books, they don't always tell you this, chess books. You need to know when you pick an opening what ideas you're, you're attempting to play in the middle game. What plans are you trying to play? What plans is your opponent trying to play? Because you need to stop them. So bishop d2, preparing to put a rook on this square. And now knight takes c3. That knight was a little bit loose there. And here pawn takes would be positionally desirable, bringing a pawn towards the center. You now have a very nice central position. But there's moves like e4 you have to watch out for. And this immediately splits up white's pawns. Because when you take there, rook takes... You leave yourself with this kind of ugly little straddler there. You know, we don't want that pawn straddling away. So bishop takes c3, placing pressure here. And now we see black's plan, knight's d4, as we've discussed. And this position has actually already been seen. Uh, Fabiano had played this with black against Wesley So this year in June in a blitz game in Paris. So Magnus has obviously prepared up to this point. And he, he now comes up with a novelty. Uh, in that game, Wesley So, I believe, captured that knight straight away. It would be a mistake to capture with your knight on f3 here, because then the bishop on c3 is very bad. So you don't want to positionally do this. And remember what we said about this rook. White has to contend with this bishop coming and pressurizing e2. But a very logical improvement, b4. Gaining space on the queen side, attacking the bishop, and going for a minority attack. A minority attack is something you do with your pawns. Here, you have two pawns coming up the board facing these three pawns, but the two pawns can act like big bullies trying to bully the three pawns. They're Spartan pawns coming down to take on outnumbered, but they can cause a lot of damage, especially when you have rooks and a bishop all aiming towards that area. The bishop drops back to d6 and if there's ever a capture on d4, the pawn on b4 is weak. So rook b1, getting behind that advanced pawn. And now white probably wants to play something like bishop takes knight and then move the knight around as we discussed to one of these squares. This knight's a very good piece in these openings. So Fabiano decides to swap that knight off. And now he plays a6 to try to hold up the advance of these pawns. a4 with a minority attack, b5. Pawn to c6, and here we have the first critical moment of the game. I think Magnus would have been quite happy with his position, and he had a very long think now, half an hour, the longest think of the game. And he kind of throws hell back on a natural move here. Now, I mentioned the minority attack, and the natural move here is continue in straightforward fashion with b5. Why is this a good move? Because you're trying to create weaknesses with in black's camp with one of these pawns and you're forcing black to make a decision here if black captures twice on b5 as such our rook flies in and now with the bishop aiming against here and the rook aiming against here black has a very uncomfortable situation that pawn highlighted is very hard to defend white can increase the pressure with queen b3 rook to b1 and everything will be aiming to take that pawn very likely white will win that pawn so black doesn't really want to do this what else would black try to do against this well probably getting rid of one pawn is correct because 
you know, if you're going to have a bad position, eliminate as many pawns as you can. And now this pawn is attacked by two pieces, only defended by one. If you defend it again with a bishop, white will take on c6. Let's have some exchanges. And we now get this pawn structure. And now black has this straggler. This is called an isolated pawn. It can't be defended by another pawn, so it's isolated. Every other pawn in the position can be defended by another pawn. e5 can be defended by f6. And everything has a pawn next to it, so this is isolated. And here Magnus can play very slowly by ganging up and trying to win this pawn, by literally tripling, doubling, trying to win this pawn. I think the issue is that Magnus was really thinking about here is, well, even if I win that pawn, so let's imagine that pawn's off the board. You have this structure. You're a pawn up, but all the pawns are on the same side of the board. This is an incredibly hard structure to win. Obviously, white can only be better because he's a pawn up, but you don't have a pass pawn in this kind of position. You probably can go something like e3 and d4 in that kind of position to create one, but even then, technically, they're probably a draw with good defense. So Magnus was taking all these things into mind. And one, one thing I've really noticed about Magnus's play is he doesn't like relieving the tension, as we saw there. He likes to keep things very tense, believing that a better opportunity will appear. I think in this situation, he was wrong to turn down b5. Very straightforward approach. He might not have won. He certainly wouldn't be able to lose, but he would have kept the pressure on Fabiano for a long, long time. And I think he probably regretted this decision. He played rook to e1, a mysterious move, but in some cases dodging away from bishop h3. But this gives black a chance to get the bishop to d7, controlling this square. So now white's minority attack can't come. Magnus now plays e3, allowing the queen sometimes to come this way. Queen f6, this is a very good move from Fabiano, and the next sequence of events um, is very intriguing. Bishop e4. f4 is a potential threat when the pin on the queen is there. And Fabiano's idea is now bishop to f5. Trying to swap off pieces, just if you're trying to draw, you're slightly on the back foot as black is very slightly here, making exchanges, just really swapping down to a more drawn position is a very sensible way to play. But also a very brave decision because now after queen f3, we had the four sequence, bishop takes bishop, queen takes f6, pawn takes f6, pawn takes e4. Material is still equal, but black has destroyed his structure on the king side. These pawns are very ugly. On the other hand, I know white has double pawns, but they're not as bad because they can all kind of support each other. Again, having pawns next to each other is very good. Black doesn't have a G pawn, meaning that that group of pawns is separated. But the next move was an incredibly clever move from Fabiano. And without this move, I, I really think Fabiano would have been struggling in this position. Given White a chance to play this b5, play the minority attack, as we've discussed before, basically Magnus's idea now is to win a pawn on the queen side, eliminate all of these pawns, and then just try to play slowly on the on the king side, maybe aiming for this pawn here. The king can try to come into f5, f4 can be played, there's pressure. But now, what is the move that Black played? A key, key move b5 and this this is a very good positional move and i think after this move fabiano doesn't really have any serious problems why why is b5 a good move well number one there are dark square bishops on the board it's getting to an ending by playing the move b5 you're placing your pawns on light squares meaning that your opponent's bishop can never ever attack these pawns it's on the wrong color square as well as that, you're fixing your opponent's pawn on a dark square, meaning your bishop can always attack that pawn. So from now on, white's pawn on b4 is always the target. You're also allowing yourself ideas of playing c5 and maybe getting this b pawn rolling down the board. So this move b5, positionally very, very clever. Also now the white bishop can never really get in the, in the game. Before there was ideas of playing b5 and maybe getting the bishop around like this, but now you can't because your pawn's in the way. So I think this is the move that really settles the, the, the position uh, for black. Let's have a look how it finished. Rook d1, bishop f8. We had an exchange on b5. King g2 with potential ideas of maybe bringing the king to f5, but 
this is all a bit wishy-washy. Fabiano takes control of both the files. Rook d c1. White's only choice and chance is to try to win this pawn on, on c6. But it's not going to happen. King g7. Black very solid. Bishop e1. And now the rook goes the right way. It goes behind the pawn. And this means there's also opportunities of black playing c5. And if you can play c5, you eliminate another pawn. Maybe you can even get a passed pawn here and play for the win. Rook c2. Trying to get some pressure here. And now the real problem with white's position is this pawn here. As we discussed, it's on a bad square. And black can target this as he does with rook to a4. This means that if white ever plays rook to c1, black just takes the pawn on b4. And there's no way uh, that white will be able to win this position. In actual fact, black has the pass pawn now. So Magnus tries king f3. Potential if he gets the king to f5. The king is a very active piece in the ending. You need to use it. But now a very good move, h5. And this will either stop the king coming in. Or if white wants the king to come in, he's going to have to play g4. More pawns get exchanged, nearer to a draw we get. Magnus tries to bring his king over to the queen side, maybe to help the defence of b4 so the rook on b1 can move. But king g6, and this, this plan is never really going to work. The king the king is, uh, is too slow coming that way. If it ever comes to c3, there'll be a c5 move, and the rook lines up against the king. h3. And now black eliminates pawns. F5. This is grandmaster technique. Well, I say grandmaster. World championship technique from Fabiano. Eliminating pawns to get to the draw. Pawn takes F5. King takes. There goes one of his pawn weaknesses. F3. Bishop E7. And now after a couple of random moves. Rook to this square. And Magnus offered a draw, which was accepted. King d7 will either defend that pawn, and probably then white has to defend this pawn. It's a draw. If anyone's made progress, it's probably black. Uh, white always has a move like g4 here, trying to get a passed pawn, but there's nothing going on here. There's no real weaknesses for either side. Well, the weaknesses there are, they both have one weakness each. They're very easily defended, so a draw, a perfectly respectable result there. Uh, so there's some interesting things. Before I leave this video, I, I want to mention about... Uh, about what's going on in this world championships i mean it's four games out of 12. i was going to have a bet on a six all draw and my bet is looking quite good the deadlock i think is going to affect magnus carlson more you can see in the press conference he's getting more and more frustrated that he's not able to break through um round one we can count off because of the nerves so maybe magnus is going to is going to show the frustration more this might be a good technique from fabiano if he can just hold let magnus get frustrated the problem is, if we come to a playoff, the quicker the time control gets, Magnus becomes much bigger favourite. He, he's very good at blitz, very good at rapid. Now, one thing that happened in the morning of today was very, very uh, controversial. These guys preparing for their game, it, it, they can it, they can spend like you know months and months and months preparing, and they prepare specifically in certain openings they have their databases and these databases are top top secret if the opponent got hold of what they you know you're going to play they would have a winning advantage it's like a battle if you know where your opponent's going to put his troops beforehand you'll better ambush them and st louis chess club in america released a video of caruana's preparation now, in that video, quite shockingly, they show, they show video footage of his computer screen. On his computer screen was his preparation for this match, and it had the variations that he was planning to play. The video got taken down quickly after St. Louis realised the mistake, but this is a massive mistake because now Magnus Carlsen has an inside knowledge into what Fabiano has prepared for this match. I'm going to show you a little clip from the press conference now when both players were asked about this and just look how annoyed Fabiano is and also stay aware for Magnus's very amusing answer. Very, very interesting psychologically. I don't know how much this is going to affect Fabiano. It would really annoy me if someone gave away all my secrets in, in a ridiculous video. I mean, it's months of work you're giving away. He must be absolutely livid. So let's have a look at this video, and that ends my um, 
well my commentary for this round please do like the video please do subscribe to the channel it helps me out a lot let's go on to this I'm going to use um, the blog or a Twitter video from uh, one of the best Twitterers out there Olympiad uh, demonstrating this I hope you can hear it all right um, I'll put my headphones on to make sure well worth only 50 seconds well worth listening to okay next question yeah please uh, Jorun from uh, NRK to Fabiano. A uh, video was pu published uh, earlier today showing your uh, openings. Uh, you know about it and uh, what do you think about it? Yeah, I'd really rather not comment on this actually. That's fair enough. <laughs> I mean, Magnus, do you have any comments or any thoughts on that at all? Um, well, uh, I'll look at the video. <laughs> Don't make up my my mind, but uh, uh, yeah, I'll uh, we'll, we'll see then. Okay, we should probably move on from that one. Very telling, very telling. Fabiano really annoyed. Magnus very happy. Cheers. I'll see you later. Mm -hmm.